worauf kann Hochzeit fassen, auch nicht spazieren gehen. Ach ja, nun lasst mir den Kopf hinter. Ach, hab ich nun den kleinen Affen. Die spielt hier keinen Fisch beim Bock nach Mieter weiter schauen. Ich kann nicht leicht dazu verstehen. Du sollst nicht an das Fenster drehen und keinen Sinn vorübergehen. Ach, dieses ist doch Zeit nur gebeten und lasst mir den Kopf stehen. Du sollst auch nicht vor meiner Hand an Sirel oder Gottlass an auf deiner Haube kriegen.
thank you all for, for being here. I'm Isaac Celia. This is Tess Klimanoff, who stage directed the, the Coffee Cantata. And we also have advisors here who collaborated with us and helped us to get more of the environmental angle. We have Les Stodem from Deep Roots Coffee, and we have Ryan Winnie Bullock from Green Umbrella. So I'm going to hand it off first to, to Les just to tell us a little bit about Deeper Roots and about coffee. And then we're going to hear from Ryan, and then we'll open it up to any questions you might have. I know some people are probably very interested in where the words came from, and what, if any, updates were made, and what, what was Bach's original, <laughs> original language there. Oh, I'm, my name's Les Stone from Deeper Roots Coffee here in Cincinnati. Uh, we've been a roasting company since 2011. Um, but before that, and really what's at the heart of what we do is a lot of work with, with farmers that are growing coffee throughout the world. Um, so, obviously, uh, with farming, as agriculture goes, it's all about the environment. It's all about the climate that farmers are, are dealing with. So, um, really, what we talk a lot about is what choices we have as individuals, both in the industry and as, as consumers. Um, and what are all those little micro choices we can make? Um, for us, we kind of feel a little bit lucky because in coffee at least, uh, it's fairly, what we think is pretty straightforward. Um, if we can support farmers um, to give them the, the income and build their economy so they can afford to make the right decisions for their own communities, um, if we can work together with other partners to find the right solutions around packaging, um, and if we can, uh, on a much bigger picture, uh, work with the, the global leaders around how we can solve the issues of transportation since obviously Kazi is a very global product and we can't grow it here in Cincinnati. Um, so this is a really interesting piece for us. Uh, obviously when we talk about one of those aspects around packaging, um, it goes all the way from how coffee is actually packaged from the farms it comes to us in, um, how it's packaged from us to the grocery stores, the cafes, uh, to your doorsteps. And then, and then lastly, obviously, how it's packaged when you guys are out and about enjoying the coffee um, out in the communities. So uh, it was a very interesting update to the piece. Uh, for us, uh, the, the issue can be seen from multiple angles uh, where we package uh, in coffee bags. It could be a 12 ounce or two pound bag or something like that. Um, and those bags have to come from somewhere as well. And so the, the look, looking at coffee pods and the K-cups and how those come out um, is really just a continuation of what we look at as packaging in general. Um, so packaging is expensive. Uh, there's a cost that comes into getting creative with it. There's a cost that comes into um, how to improve uh, what is cheap, and cheap is plastic. Um, the other things that tend to look cheap are convenience. Um, but as you look deeper, convenience is usually coming at a, at a cost, both to our own pocketbooks as consumers, but also to the environment. Um, so one of the key points we always make with folks is with the coffee pods, uh, that little pod may have about 11 ounces, or 11 grams of coffee in it. Um, maybe those are around a dollar or more per pod. You know, when you break that down to comparing it to a bag of coffee, that's around $30 for a 12 ounce bag of coffee. <laughs> and so uh, you can buy some really nice coffee and treat the farmers very, very well at that same price point. And so that's one of the first places we always talk about is, is really what the cost is to us as individuals. Then you can really pull out, and what is that convenience cost costing the, the environment? Um, and uh, the comparison to French press versus a K-cup is a really straightforward, easy one. Um, you saw on stage in the middle of performance, they basically pulled off what it takes to make a French press. So uh, you can create that same in, you know, method of brewing in your daily morning rituals in your home um, with not that much more inconvenience um, out of your, your life. Three minutes, if you have pre-ground coffee ready to go, uh, you can make a French press pretty quick. Um, lastly, and I think that, that really is more with all of our coffee houses around the community is it comes down to that packaging of, of the brew coffee. So obviously the takeaway cup, uh, all that paper, um, all lined with plastic as well. Um, 
is, for the most part, outside of, thankfully now in Cincinnati here with, with Rumpke's recycling programs, um, is just going in the trash. Um, and even with Rumpke here now taking disposable paper cups, um, in their processes, there's a very small percentage of those cups that are actually happening to, to go into that stream. Um, so uh, look for shops that are using compostable uh, paperware as the next thing. Uh, if you can't uh, pull off bringing your own travel mug, uh, it's usually one of the easiest things, but again, it's about convenience. Um, I'm always guilty of it too, just like <laughs> anybody else. Uh, my partner, John, who was out front, you noticed when he was drinking his coffee, at our booth, he's drinking out of ceramic. He's the best person I've ever seen. No matter where we're traveling in the world, he has a ceramic cup somewhere. <laughs> uh, but um, with the uh, with all of that, obviously there's a cost. Again, so compostable products do cost a little bit more than, than plastic-based ones. Um, our packaging is plant-based. Um, that comes at a cost, um, and helping farmers do the right activities that um, promote the sustainability of their own environments they're in come at a cost. And so it's really about looking at what we can do as individuals, just these micro decisions again, and how we can affect change in coffee. I could keep going on <laughs> agriculture of coffee, but I could take a full time. So if you have questions around that, you can just keep coming up. Right, you want yeah, to talk about sure. Right? So, um, I'm Ryan Mooney Bullock. I'm the executive director of Green Umbrella, which is a nonprofit organization here in Greater Cincinnati. We serve a 10-county metropolitan area, and we really focus on bringing together people across all different sectors, from business to government to other nonprofits, education institutions, to collaborate on big picture challenges that no one entity can tackle on their own. And so we've worked in a wide variety of issues over the years. It kind of depends on like what are the most burning issues of our time. Obviously right now, climate is a big part of that. Um, we also have done a lot of work around the trail system, um, biking and walking trails, and we, we do a lot related to food as well. So we manage the Greater Cincinnati Regional Food Policy Council, which convenes partners in the food system to think through how can we make sure that our, our regional food system is resilient and sustainable. Um, not just from a like environmental standpoint, but from a like, let's make sure that we can grow food that can feed our, our population. I think we all saw um, through the pandemic that we are vulnerable to disruptions in our food system and we wanna make sure that we can continue to build out what's available locally. Um, another big piece to that is infrastructure. And I won't go into this in a whole lot of detail, but um, it takes a lot to get food from a farm to the grocery store or a restaurant. And, um, we have been fortunate enough to be a, a part of helping to build out the distribution infrastructure in our region um, so that farmers who are growing locally and using great sustainable practices can do things like sell to grocery stores or to sell to schools or other large buyers because there are a lot of barriers that get in the way to simple things like that happening. And I can talk, I can talk more based on what you all are interested in. <laughs> Tess, is there anything you want to add about how you approached this piece and like the updates that you made from what what Boff wrote and how it may have made sense nowadays or may not have? Sure, yeah, so um, the original text of the piece is pretty outdated in that um, back when it was written, there was a societal promiscuity to drinking coffee that is no longer present in today's society. So um, Herr Schlendrian trying to get his daughter to stop drinking coffee because of the way it would appear, the way she would seem out in the world, that's not really relevant anymore. And I wanted to do something that was more modern, um, which required us to update. And so I thought it would make much more sense and tie in our environmental focus of the concert series to have um, her dad, instead of trying her to, to get her to quit drinking coffee, instead trying to get her to quit drinking coffee in a way that is wasteful and switch to a more sustainable um, micro habit. <laughs> um, I like that word. Um, and so I updated the translation so that that would all start to make sense. Um, there's also a number of things that Schlendrian calls his daughter that we updated in particular. <laughs> um, 
and we switched up to calling her wasteful, etc., um, because that makes much more sense. Um, so yeah, that's I think that's all of it. Cool. I, in a second, I want to open it up to any questions you might have, but I'd like to ask you all a question first. Just do like a quick poll with our random sampling of people who from an admittedly biased samples because of people who like classical music to begin with, but who here drinks coffee ever? <laughs> Daily? Daily? Okay. Daily? Multiple times a day? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, who use, does anyone here use French press as their preferred method? Okay. Um, some type of, of filtered coffee, like pour over, something like that. Um, AeroPress, anyone like really? Oh, wow, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> is that anyone willing to admit that they occasionally <laughs> might, might use K-Pods? Okay, okay, okay. It's, it's convenient, it's convenient. At work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they have terrible coffee at work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at the very least, the K-Cup gives you a consistent whatever it is, to making an appropriate amount of coffee for the day or for whoever's there. And that's something that now that not everybody works in the office, we kind of like take random polls like, okay, who's going to drink coffee? Because I think that one of the most uh, sustainable things you can do when it comes to coffee is not waste it, right? Like it takes a lot of resources to grow coffee, to transport, all those things. And so if we can be attentive to like the volume that we use, and what can we do with the leftovers, like make ice coffee or do ice cubes, other things like that, instead of just pouring it down the drain. One thing you can do in the office also is you can get those reusable um, pods, so you can bring your own ground coffee, and so you don't you're not creating any trash, but you still have the convenience of having whatever coffee you pick. Question. I, I brew mine at home and put coffee maker and take it in a coffee thermos, and it'll stay warm. Any any other questions at all for, for anyone involved in this process? Yes, please, any. How far are we from getting grocery stores to take note of some of, you know, I mean, how far are we from getting some of these products off the shelves in the grocery stores? That sounds like a policy <laughs> question. The one thing that I can speak to, I don't know if it's quite what you're talking about, but um, the, the packaging issue that Les mentioned, there, there are starting to be pilots with returnable containerware from stores. And actually, P&G is participating in some of those. None of them are happening in Cincinnati, as far as I'm aware. Um, but companies like haagen and other um, entities are kind of creating like glass or other reusable, heavy, you know, more heavy-duty plastic materials that can actually be returned to the store, kind of like how the milk man used to deliver milk bottles in glass. So I think there is... They're starting to realize that there is a, a demand for that and an appetite, and they're trying to figure out the logistics to kind of get that more mainstream. Yeah, I will say it's not with the whole bean coffee or the bags of coffee versus the, the cups. It's so far still going the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. It's definitely going more cups and away from the... And part of it is the, the notions of recyclability of those, um, granted, there's major issues and lawsuits happening with all of that. So, but. so you're saying it's going more back to bad coffee? No, no, it's still continuing in the direction of more, more of the cups. And then also, where could we buy your coffee? Ah, there's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think this goes to a lot of the, the, the for us, it's kind of like, if it's not the grocery store, then where? And so there's a lot of other options. Where can you buy our coffee? Yeah. Um, so, a lot of cafes all around the city, independent coffee houses, um, we'll have our coffee. Closest to here would be the Country Fresh Farm uh, Market over in um, uh, Wyoming. Wyoming. Is it Hartwell? I think it's Hartwell. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. yeah just so pretty close to here. Um, they'll have on the shelves there. And, um, citrus tree as well. Anybody's familiar with citrus tree? That's right, up, up Whitten. You can get some 
there while you pick up your uh, produce for the season. What is the state of free trade coffee? I've read things, I'm sorry, I can't be more specific, that it's kind of scam. <laughs> Depends on what you read, uh, <laughs> for sure. Uh, and there are just 25, over 25 million coffee farmers in the world producing coffee. Um, and on top of that, the millions of people who are laborers in those fields, who are involved in the, the processing side, the shipping side. So it's, and it's across the entire belt of the, of the world. So it's a complex um, industry there's a lot of different levels. There's huge farms, big agro-industrial farms that take up tens of thousands of acres and grow coffee in the full sun. There's uh, basically what we would consider kind of garden farmers um, who grow coffee in their backyard and just produce you know, 20 pounds a year and that gives them a little cash to sustain their family. So it's a really complex industry. Some of it, so some of the um, Things that have been attempted over the past decades are uh, fair trade labeling schemes where there's a certification process that happens all the way from the farm level all the way through to the coffee that's on the shelf in a grocery store. And it gets labeled much like organic standards. Um, there's other ones that are, that are similar. There's even that system is split between the global and the US version. Um, so it's, it's got complex um, for us where we're at. Uh, we choose to go with the direct trade model, which uh, requires a lot more heavy lifting on our part um, because it's all about building trust, um, trust with the relationships that we have with our growers, and trust with our, with our customers, and that we aren't labeling something on our bag that says we checked a box, um, we went through this system, but instead we're, we're storytelling. So we're, we're talking about what is going on in the life of these farmers, what part of the world, what's their context, um, what uh, your purchase of their coffee um, is doing to help facilitate uh, improvements in their own communities. Um, and the beautiful part of that that makes it fun for us versus, I don't, know, I don't think I've had the same passion if I was in the paper industry or something, but uh, it tastes good <laughs> when you have that kind of um, loop of information. So consumers, get better quality, farmers get more excited because they get feedback on what's good quality. They can invest more um, into what they're doing and it's really a win-win-win um, to everybody. Beyond just coffee, what are your favorite things to do with the coffee grounds? Is there anything I should know about? That's for anyone. Mm -hmm. We compost them all. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I've heard of such things. Yeah. So I like to put coffee grounds around the house on the fence of it. Oh. I don't know that it works. <laughs> like around the outside? Yeah, around the outside of the house. Yeah. yeah, I think my father does something like that in the garden. Yeah. I don't know if it's effective. <laughs> it's good for yeah. your plants, too. Yeah. 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 You can put it, mix it with the soil. Okay. It helps acidify soil. So if you're growing plants that are acid-loving, or more acid-loving than your soil is, you can mix it in when you plant the plant and also use it as a top dressing. Instead of uh, baking soda in your refrigerator, just oh. put the coffee grounds in there. Oh. Oh. Yeah, that's for smell, right? Yeah, yeah to absorb orders. Huh. Huh. And I ask a, a sort of musical question. When I was a kid, there was a, a great uh, pianist, comedian, who used to play Bach repetitive parts and he said, I think his mind was on something else when he was playing when he was playing that part because there are sections in Bach where you feel he's he's almost sort of caught on his spot and so on. Bach drank a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't get it. maybe it's my insensitivity. I didn't get any sense of that uh, that kind of repetitive quality in this piece. So I, well, I've been living with this piece for the past six months, so I feel like there are parts of it that I've repeated a few thousand times. So. <laughs> I would, but yeah, I would say um, I'm really happy to hear you say that because I tried really hard in the staging to make every repetition different in what mm -hmm. people were doing because it is quite repetitive. Most of the arias <laughs> are very repetitive, and unless you do something different, it will get boring. Which is why I love that we staged this because most of the time it's done just standing there. 
and I could definitely, if as a spectator, I would see my, feel my mind wandering. Um, yeah. Once you've watched the translation once, you know, you get the idea. Uh, to that point, I, I'll take a question in a second. You can go online and you can see a digitized copy of the manuscript parts that they used to perform this piece for the first time. And you can see how resource sensitive they were in terms of trying to conserve space. That they'll try to like cram as many notes on one page, and then like, like Tess said, there are a lot of repeats. Instead of writing it out, they'll just be like, then do that again. <laughs> so it's been really, really save, save paper. So I don't know the text and any speak English. So in the original text, the father is opposed to coffee because coffee is this uh, sign of, of living a wanton life. So he wouldn't be saying drink French press. So in the original, what wouldn't be saying drinking coffee, drink coffee. In so the original, what was yeah, so he was trying to get her to stop drinking coffee altogether, and when he actually threatened to not allow her to marry, which we changed to boyfriend here, um, when he threatened to not allow her ever to marry, she agreed, but her stipulation was that in the marriage contract it would be written that her husband would allow her to drink coffee oh, whenever man. he wanted. <laughs> now, of course, all of these things no longer make sense. <laughs> Because that's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but back then, you know, um, she was saying, okay, whichever man owns me now will, uh, <laughs> will let me drink coffee. So that, that was what it was originally. Um, so when they were singing in German, were they singing what you had up above? Are there any native speakers of German here? <laughs> Our apologies. Our apologies. Okay. No, they were they were singing the original text with all the misogyny and, and things that are kind of dated. When and where was performed in the original form? I think it was performed. We don't know the exact date, but the best guess is 1735 at uh, a coffee house. It was a Zimmermann's coffee house where Bach. In addition to being the music director at uh, the St. Thomas Church in Leipzig, was appointed as music director of like a student concert series in a coffee house. Huh. And this Bach didn't write any operas, but this is probably the closest thing he wrote to an opera for this coffee house setting, where, where people would gather to, to drink coffee, which was okay for the men, I guess, and to discuss ideas and kind of kind of play play you know lighthearted music. Was it produced after Bach's time? Uh, I think it, it kind of fell off, and m like much of Bach's music, was kind of like forgotten for a long time until like, Mendelssohn kind of rediscovered him. So it, it had a rocky reception history. But which Bach wrote this thing? Which Bach? <laughs> J.S. composed it, but J.C., his son, did a lot of the, the copying work. So you, it was a Bach family... Production. Yeah. <laughs> this is more a history of coffee question, which is okay if you don't know, but did coffee taste the same in 1735? Yeah. Like, is, no. is that even recognizable to us today? Yeah, what year was this? 1735. 1735? Uh, no. 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 Uh, so <laughs> it depends on where you get your coffee. Yeah. So there's, there's been a lot of developments, but so his coffee would be mostly coming in the 1700s via East Africa and um, Southeast Asia, or like Indonesia, Java, um, through, yeah, those kind of areas. And so, in some respects, it would have been somewhat sim similar. Um, after that, there's a, a big disease that went through a lot of those areas of coffee, and there was a, a changing of species planted from Arabica to Robusta. And so that after that, there's a lot of changes in coffee taste. Um, until the Americas became bigger producers. Um, and so it would have been a little bit different for me, I think, but it's more about how it was brewed. So what they would have been, how they would have brewed coffee would have been probably boiling water, um, it would have been burnt. And, uh, I don't know, uh, <laughs> what was the line, a thousand kisses? Yeah. Sweeter, <laughs> sweeter, yeah. sweeter, yeah. I don't think my son was really into what that meant. But, uh, that, uh, the coffee out of the French press today would be way closer to a thousand kisses than whatever she would be <laughs> <laughs> In the 18th century, I think coffee houses were not so much associated with uh, loose living as with 
political conspiracies uh, and were very political sort of places. Even if Dr. Samuel Johnson and so forth is always sort of talking about the whole world of the, of the coffee thing. So it was not, I mean, of course it works easier for jokes to have it be, uh, you know, vaguely sexual, mm -hmm. it's a dangerous place, but it was also, I think, uh, very, very much a, a hotbed of political ideas. Mm -hmm. Are there coffee groves in the United States? Hawaii, um, but on continental U.S., there's only like like a farm in Santa Barbara County. Um, just happens to have this pretty unique, interesting microclimate for tropical um, fruits and things like that. Which brings me to my question, which is, uh, when do we expect coffee to be able to be grown? Based on the projections, <laughs> <laughs> because it will happen at some point, and our people yeah. starving for it. Can I answer that? With yeah. That? Is the band moving, shifting? It? Well, there's two factors. It's the temperature, obviously, with, with the two degrees Celsius increase that we're, we're coming upon here. Uh, temperatures could allow for it, but the other issue is sunlight hours. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain just problem with going too much further past the tropics. Uh, where you just run out of sunlight hours for it to be able to produce produce enough. That said, you can go to Crone Conservatory and find coffee plants that will have cherries growing on them, but it would, it would never be the production to... And is, has the world supply changed? Right now, not so much. It's moved around and shifted. Um, there's countries like Vietnam that are you know, the second largest producer of coffee into Brazil, which didn't used to be the case. Um, other co countries are, are struggling uh, very much because um, the industry is somewhat failing in terms of having the proper support to, to have yields <coughs> in the face of... Right now, for, for farmers, it's inconsistencies. It's unpredictability. So weather patterns that used to be fairly predictable are pretty un unpredictable. <coughs> um, so yields are being lost. There's an increase. The disease that, that the fungus, it's a rust for coffee that went through and destroyed a lot of the, the fields back in the 1800s, is showing up in areas in the Americas where it never used to show up higher up on the mountains. So, in terms of your, your piece of it's moving further north or south, it's actually moving higher up the mountains right now um, to try to escape some of that disease and the, uh, the moisture and things that's, that's causing it. I start with drink with what drink what you enjoy. So find what you enjoy. Um, otherwise, it's not. There's no point in drinking coffee. <laughs> um, so even though I'm a, a coffee roaster, I make my living based on people drinking coffee because of the caffeine. Um, I'm a firm proponent of if you don't actually like it, you're just drinking it for caffeine. Then there's probably other things you could be doing. Um, but drink it because you enjoy it, and find coffee that you you enjoy. Um, so skip the office coffee pot and find coffee that you actually enjoy. Start there, start asking questions. Um, does the, per the place you're buying it from or the packaging have information that you can get at to where it's coming from? Who actually produced this coffee? How did it get to me? Um, what uh, investments are being made in, in to the, the supply chain and, and to the growers that grew it? Um, and just educate yourself. In terms of brewing, there's a ton of, of fun content online all over the place around just different methods of brewing, um, ways to get the most out of your just your coffee pot at home and, and get the best out of it. Um, for me, the biggest tool you can buy is a $20 kitchen scale. Um, start with a kitchen scale, learn to brew based on weight versus scoops, um, and from, from right there you can start to change just how much coffee you use and, and get consistency and, and, and enjoy that better. And from there you can just get sucked into a lot of rabbit holes. <laughs> all of a sudden you're ending up brewing nothing but arrow presses. You can look up what an arrow press is. You, know. uh, you touched on the issue of transportation. And that it's a huge point in the standard across food and ground. Uh, what would be an iron thinking about how to solve something like that? Especially if you're saying that something like coffee can't possibly be done anywhere near. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, I think number one, whatever it is the solution is, it's going to cost more. Um, and so uh, there's issues with that. There's like three global companies that run ocean freight basically in the entire world. It comes down to about three, com com three companies. And so as long as there's only three companies involved in global freight, there's going to be zero innovation and motivation um, to improve it. So that's a big, that goes a little bit over uh, my pay grade. Um, <laughs> from, from there, uh, if you're really concerned about, the, about miles traveled, um, the Americas are closer than Sumatra. Um, and so the, there's that piece. Um, I'm not a, an expert on, on carbon footprint calculations, and, uh, but the, the bigger piece is really in terms of carbon is going to be the transportation on land versus in the ocean, too. And so those ocean freighters carry massive, massive amounts of weight. And they go pretty slow across the water. Um, but a dirty diesel truck delivering from one coast to the other coast and then roasted and put on a, another truck and, or put in an airplane and air freighted to FedEx in Memphis and then truck from Memphis to here. That's where it all starts adding up. And so buying from a local roaster um, can find some savings in some of that. Just not nearly as much as obviously buying local produce though because it's obviously a local yeah. so. Okay, uh, here, let's go with... Um, you haven't asked a question yet, right? Yeah, okay. um, this isn't exactly a question, but I just wanted to say nobody else has said that coffee is delicious. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> with the oat milk, and, and the performance is delicious. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Glad to and hear it. passed around in particular, I was so transfixed by it and so moved that I feel like it's these issues that are normally really important everything you guys are talking about. I'm sort of in this pastoral, you know, sort of in this different mode mood as a result of the sublime performance. I come with a pure coffee making. Pods work best. I don't know why nobody makes it. I'm using a pod. You familiar with pure coffee making? Mm hmm Yep. Mm. Explain your separate little thing that you fill. Okay, so the uh, the reusable ones that she was talking about, you can use them in your Keurig. Um, you can find them online. You can find them in a lot of grocery stores. But they're essentially instead of those plastic cups with a little paper filter in them, they're just a little your plastic in with a metal metal filter, and you can buy any coffee you want, um, grind it fresh, which is always a big win in terms of the enjoyment of coffee, and then measure out how much you put in there, and then use your Keurig to put it in. much of a connoisseur, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Rose, you had another, another question? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know, I had another musical question. The Sixth Symphony, as I recall, was always called the pastoral, and I wondered if that idea in any way affected I mean, you could sort of imagine hearing uh, shepherd's pipes in certain points and so forth, but I wondered if how it affected your uh, uh, relation to the text. So, when we were putting this concert together, we had to think of something to put with the, the coffee cantata, and something that in some way had some kind of an environmental connection. So, I, I think the Sixth Symphony, right, calling it the pastoral, is, is a really interesting piece of, of cultural history that it gives us a sense of what hiking could have been like in, in Beethoven's time. That, like, we have a depiction of a sudden thunderstorm, as he experienced it, of, of birds, actual bird song that he heard right before he went deaf. Um, so it, it just shows us that environmentalism, or like a love of nature, is a through line. Much the same way that music communicates emotions that are universal human emotions that have always been felt you know, by, by anyone with human programming. I think this is another instance of something that it's not, we're not unique in caring about the environment. You know, Beethoven similarly cared about his environment. Any, any other? Um, back to that, someone mentioned that oat milk, so I just want to say I appreciate from an environmental standpoint that you know, oat milk is available in the water and the boat is so much less than the water and it's a very a solid choice. <laughs> <laughs> 
Any other thoughts, questions? This is my first attendance at the Queens of the Opera. It won't be my last, but I, too, was really impressed by the music. Where did most of your musicians come from? CCM. Okay. This is, we, we consider it like the CCM All-Stars. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> people, people who are like finishing advanced degrees or who have you know, graduated and stick around. And, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I would just throw out there that I really appreciate the fact that you're focusing on these themes as well. And I also found the, the symphony just so inspiring. I think that um, ultimately when we're looking at changing people's minds and hearts about their daily choices or about uh, how, how in they go on um, taking environmental action, it's all about culture change, right? And so when we see these themes popping up in culture wherever we find it, whether it's a stage like this or a TV show or you know on the news, I think the more it gets ingrained in our thinking and, and the future choices we might make. So thank you. We'll keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all.